All right, thank you. Um, so to set the stage, we're going to look at um, integer solutions um, to the Diophantine equation, uh, sums of four squares is equal to an integer n. Uh, this integer n we assume to be odd. And the reason for this is n is the, the divisible by a high power of 2. And then there are not really many solutions. Right? And so these points, they live on a, a sphere of radius square root n. And we're going to project them down to uh, S3. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, cool. And so it's a, it's a classical theorem that these points, as n goes to infinity, um, are dense on S3, and moreover, actually equidistribute with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Right? And so you can start talking about, let's say, rate of equidistribution, or you can start talking about um, uh, approximation of points on S3. And, and I'll talk about the, the latter one. OK. So you, you can define the quantity, let's say, epsilon n, um, as uh, the supremum of points xi in S3, or the infimum of the distances of these nice points um, to xi. OK, cool. So what is this quantity? Um, so this quantity is like the largest, uh, the smallest epsilon, such that if you center a, a ball of radius epsilon around all of these points, you cover the whole sphere. And so as that, you can say, um, so with volume arguments, that gives you like a lower bound of epsilon. But in fact, you can do a little bit better than that. And the reason for this is that these, these rational points, they behave a little bit like humans. Like they need their personal space. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and where you can see this best is, uh, let's say, at the North Pole. Right, so if you consider the point 1, 0, 0, 0, Right, the, the closest points that you can get here um, will look like a floor of square root n, and then some indices. And then the second set of closest points will be floor of square root n um, minus 1, and then also something. And so if you, you draw them, um, so the first set of points can actually be very close. Indeed, if n is actually a square, it's the point itself. Right. Um, but then the, the second set of closest points, they, they're further away. So in fact, that this distance here is at least uh, n to the minus 1 fourth. And so that gives a lower bound of epsilon n. So, uh, okay. And so um, Sarnak here conjectures that this is the only kind of like restriction on the size of epsilon n. So indeed, uh, Epsilon n should be bounded by n to the minus 1 fourth plus, let's say, some little o of 1. Right. Okay, and so what is Sarnak able to prove? Um, Sarnak shows um, that epsilon n uh, can be bounded by n to the minus 1 sixth plus little o of 1. And he does this using the, the theory of automorphic forms for the quaternion algebra and then makes use of uh, the Linz estimate for the Hecke uh, eigenvalues. I should also uh, mention uh, Sodari here, who recovers this result uh, using the, the circle method. But his result is more general in the sense that it, uh, it proves optimal results on epsilon n for higher dimensional spheres. So for S4, S5 on, um, he recovers the optimal exponents here. Right. And today, I would like to sketch like a, a, an old approach to like these sort of problems, um, which I guess goes back to, like, say, Klostermann. And so the way that goes is uh, you, you start with some bump function. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. R plus zero, bless you. Uh, and say the support of this bump function is uh, ah, is in contained in 0, 1. Right. And so we want to analyze the, the quantity, um, the following quantity. Okay. 
So if we can show that this quantity is positive, that means we've found at least one of these points, um, which is closer than epsilon to psi. So if we can show that this quantity is positive, then we show that uh, epsilon n is, uh, is at most epsilon. So we want to prove that this is positive independent of psi um, for as small epsilon as we can. And so what you do here is kind of you spectrally expand uh, omega in terms of spherical functions. And so this looks like as follows. Um, So here, un are the Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind, which uh, happen to be the, the spherical uh, functions um, we require here for S3. Okay. And so now the, the n equals 1 term, this is just the constant function, and that will give us kind of the main term. And so we want to show that the remaining terms are And so what you do to understand this, you write this as like a, a Fourier coefficient of some generating function. Right, so you write down the following function. And then, uh, Z is in the upper half plane, and uh, this function e of Z is just exp of uh, 2 pi i Z. Just a short notation. So it turns out that this function here, I've written down, is, is a theta function, and in particular, it's a modular form, and it's a cusp form if n is bigger than 1, and it's uh, of weight. Uh, n plus 1 for the theta subgroup uh, with odd multiplier system. Uh, okay, so where the theta subgroup is the following subgroup of SL2Z. Okay, and where uh, gamma is either congruent to like, the identity or congruent to this transposition mod 2. Okay. And so for those of you who don't know what a modular form is, well you can, for the purpose of this talk, you can imagine that this function is just uh, invariant on the action of theta um, on, on the upper half plane, so, okay, which is given by Mobius transformations. All right, so we've reduced the problem kind of to understanding uh, the Fourier coefficient, the nth Fourier coefficient of, of this. And, um, cool. And so you can now write this uh, hat n as the integral from uh, 0 plus uh, iy to 2 plus iy. Okay, cool. And so when you look at this contour here on the upper half plane, so we have uh, uh, 0 here, 1 here, 2 here. And so if you take uh, y to be relatively small, it will be somewhere down here. And then using the, the action of the theta subgroup, we can project this back up to some fundamental domain. For the theta subgroup, this looks like this. Right. And so we can project it back up here. And this line becomes you know, some some other lines like this. Right. And so we can kind of like restrict to like these, these kind of segments and expand this integral. And so it turns out you get then something that more really looks like this. Um, this is some sum.
Okay, so this is a classical close sum and sum, and this will be the J Bessel function. So uh, at first, this looks like a little bit of recursive, because the thing we tr we're trying to understand on the left-hand side also appears on the right-hand side. Right? Um, but we're actually in good shape, because we understand a whole lot better um, an average over this Fourier coefficient than an individual one. And so kind of you can then now do a little bit further analysis um, and plug everything back. And so you essentially um, reduce I mean, you can reduce then the problem to to the following type of sums. C, little c is of size big C, 1 over c. And you still have this close to one sum. Uh, where this, this exponential factor here now comes from um, like the tail of the Bessel function, kind of. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I can write down now a theorem um, by myself, uh, Browning, and Kumaraswami. Kumaras. Namely that if you Oh, sorry, I should put an alpha here as well. If you assume that this, this type of sums are bounded um, by, let's say, C, M, and N to the epsilon, then you can show that uh, this epsilon N, this quantity there, um, is indeed bounded by n to the minus 1 fourth plus a little o of 1. So Sarnay's conjecture is true. So at first, I mean, this may seem like just a conjecture that comes out of the blue. Um, but indeed, it's a, it's a generalization of like a classical conjecture by Linick and Selberg, where alpha is equal to 0, um, where you just sum up the close to sums. And conjecture is that you, you get additional cancellation there, uh, like optimal cancellation, in fact. Because um, so these close to sums, due to the while bound, they're bounded in, a, in essence by square root c. And it's believed that uh, they kind of behave, their sign behaves randomly. And so you should get another kind of square root cancellation. And you also see if c becomes very large, right? So then this is essentially 1. So it becomes the classical conjecture. And if c is, uh, very small, this is uh, behaves randomly. Um, so that there might be like a space in between where things can go wrong, and you can actually see that a bit. I mean, they don't go explicitly wrong. Um, but uh, so, so what you kind of can do to understand these sort of sums is apply uh, Kuznetsov's formula, which then relates sort of sums of close to sums back to kind of like these model of forms. So Fourier coefficients of these modular forms and even mass forms as well, uh, with the mass forms. And so kind of what you can say that this, this conjecture is at least true if you like say this is like a smooth sum, right, not sharp cutoffs. It's at least true in the C direction. Um, so maybe I should write here also alpha is bounded by 2. Um, so this conjecture is at least true. In the C direction, so the hard part is really the M and N direction, the uniformity in the M and N direction. <coughs> and I was just saying, um, like Kuznetsov kind of gives you something um, also in the M and N direction, but unfortunately, uh, what you can get from that, it's not quite sufficient as technology right now to pr improve, uh, I guess, Sarnak's result unconditionally. Um, yeah, I guess that's about what I wanted to say. Thank you.